And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit our tables? Every week, we like to take this look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of this week in review at tabletopbellhop.com under On Our Tabletop. So as I just mentioned, this past weekend was our Extra Life, uh, was the Extra Life Tabletop Appreciation Day. And we consider this our, our Extra Life warm-up day because we're going to be doing the big thing on November 2nd and 3rd. But we also want to take part in Tabletop Appreciation Day. So we were at the CG Realm on Saturday uh, for a full 12 hours. But first, we actually played some Sorcerer three-player the night before the event. Both Tori and Kat were out of town camping, so Gloomhaven was off. But I was heading down to Windsor for the Extra Life event, so we took this chance to check out and live stream Sorcerer from White Wizard Games. Three-player with the bellhop Deanna and I. With three players, uh, we've talked about Sorcerer before. With three players, there is a special mode you have to use. It's, it's called Battle Royal. Um, this mode can be played with three or more players, up to six players. Though there's only actually enough components in the box to play with four, with a core box. If you want to play five or six, you have to buy a second box or some of the expansion packs, which should be in stores, actually, I think, this weekend. Now, Battle Royal, you're still fighting over zones of London, but the battle zones are placed between each player. And players can only interact with the zones on their left and right, which actually reminds me quite a bit of uh, Between Two Cities from Stonemaier Games. Yeah, the setup was straightforward enough, though the play order for resolving battles was non-trivial yeah. to keep it balanced, and it would have benefited from a marker of some sort to help us keep track of the, the turn order in that way. Yeah, we might have to, to go with the uh, drunk board gamers and paint a rock with an arrow on it the next time we play. Um... Now, what happens with this game is you're still fighting over the battlefields, but instead of winning a battlefield and it getting destroyed, instead it resets. So all minions at the location are destroyed on both sides of the field. Uh, the zone resets to full health, and the player who won the zone gets one point. And the first player to three points wins the overall match between the three of us. Or if you were playing six, it would be the same thing. First player to three points. I guess say overall it went pretty well. Um, Sean, you seem to pick up pretty good, uh, pick up the game pretty quick. I don't remember any rule problems, though, like you said, it did take us a bit to get those three-player battle timing down. Yeah. I don't even know if we quite had it by the end. <laughs> now, I got caught making one mistake that would have made a big difference between Deanna and I, but I don't think ultimately it would have changed yeah. the end game result at that point. It was late enough in the game. Now, I do think you picked up the game quick because of your experience with like Magic the Gathering. I think that's because you've played those dueling error or key forge or those other dueling games. I think that really helps with being able to grasp sorcerer. Yeah. Now, having played a handful of times now myself at different player counts, I got to say that it felt a little weird with three players. Um, for one, there's really no reason to move your troops. Like I couldn't see any point in moving my troops um, and flying was literally useless. So I have a bunch of guys in one of the decks that cost more than I can fly and that means nothing. Um, it also means the rally action never got used because why would you move your troops? But really, like, those were kind of minor. The biggest problem, though, that I had while playing, and I think you guys experienced it as well, was the downtime overall game length. Because with three players, whenever two players are resolving one of the battlefields, the other player literally has nothing to do. Now, they probably care who wins, but... You can't influence the battle at all. It's not like you could spend your old men tokens to cause people to re-roll and stuff like that. Now, I guess I don't think it was terrible downtime, but it did mean, at least the game we were playing, that that third player tended to pick up their phone and start doing something else. I can only imagine how bad that could be, though, with four or five or six players. I, I completely agree. The game dragged some, and even when editing the video for tomorrow's YouTube release, <laughs> I found myself speeding up some sections because there was just nothing really happening you know between and if one person's thinking and sitting uh, thinking about their team then the other two people are doing mm -hmm. nothing and there's nothing going on yeah like there's so, literally nothing to do yeah and i say you care like you're like eh, i care but if you were a fourth player like you wouldn't care at all what that person across the table is doing or five or six it's like playing seven wonders where you only worry about the player on your left and your right right well when the battle's going on the other end of the table i don't know now, as for the overall game length, uh, it took us three hours to play a three-player game. 
Now that's more than twice as long as our usual two player games player games have been taking. Now I do have to admit, and Deanna said the same thing. It didn't really feel like it took that long. So I guess that's good. Like the game's engaging enough that we didn't really notice the hours pa passing, but just for a, that style of game, right? The dueling card game, I, I think fast paced. And I got to say, I can think of other three player, three hour games I'd rather play or two one and a half hour games I could play in that same time. And, and I think part of the reason that this game wasn't as painful was that the three of us just don't get to sit down and play any games that yeah. often. Uh, if we were playing together every week, I don't know if it would have been as bearable <laughs> to have uh, sat through that for three weeks. I could see that. Now, at this point, I got to say, I, I can't recommend Sorcerer at three players. And I'm sorry to say I'm not really interested in, in ever trying Battle Royal with four or five or six. Like, no, I, I'll turn that down. Even for review purposes, I, don't, I, I can tell you it's not going to be good. I got to say, though, like this is I'm, I'm bashing on Sorcerer here, but actually overall, though, I still really do like the game. I think it's a fantastic two player game. And I even liked it playing teams, which was cool. But just no, not three. I, I think I've had enough of that. Yeah, absolutely. The lack of focus and ease of distraction when some of it just doesn't matter to you. Uh, yeah. The lack of importance of some of the basic gaming elements like flying just makes this an irrelevant game mode to me. I can't see the purpose of it. I mean, I, I understand that they wanted to have a larger group format, but uh, unfortunately, I think you've got a really solid two or team player game. Mm. Stick with it. Hide the fact that you you tried this Battle Royale mode. And if I remember the last time we talked about Sorcerer and you'd looked it up on Board Game Geek, I think the, the majority of players seem to agree with us on this one as well. Yeah, they call it two-player only. They don't even mention it higher, and probably because of the Battle Royale and, and mm. the team is just considered two-player, basically. Yeah, Deanna's saying right in the chat right now, too, it's, it did overstay its welcome. Like, it was for, fun for the first third. Okay, I didn't think it was quite that bad. I would say about <laughs> half of it, but... So, as I mentioned at the top of the segment, and the segment before this past Saturday was our Extra Life charity gaming event. Our first one, our first step on the road to Extra Life, or our first stop, I guess, on our road to Extra Life. Uh, we were at the CG Realm, all three of us, and we gamed for 12 hours straight. Probably a little bit more than that, if you count setup and not. Uh, Sean was down. We streamed the entire thing on our Twitch stream. We sold baked goods and coffee, kindly donated by the Coffee Exchange. Cheat jars were out. Uh, things seemed to go good, and we raised over 200 bucks. Now, while we didn't get a large group checking in online, it was good to see a face here and there mm -hmm. checking in as much of what we were do uh, as much of what we were doing was testing ideas and methods for the big stream in November. Yeah, which I think we're still going to go forward with. That's something we, we talked about wondering, like, because we did. We had viewers throughout the day, but we didn't have a big rush of people. Uh, as for the physical event and the store that day, the crowd was a good mix. Uh, there was a mix of regulars and new gamers. I'm especially happy to see the new gamers. That's something that, that I, I love to see. Uh, plus, it's good for the store, good for the event. Um, I got to sit down to a bunch of local gamers I hadn't met before, which actually doesn't happen that often. Um, I tend to know most of them. There was some new people there, which was cool. And I got to say, I think the event overall, even if we didn't raise the money we were hoping to, I think it was great for getting the word out about the other events. And almost everyone I talked to had looked at the roadmaps we had on the table and were getting excited about future events. Like I had people saying, you know, I took the day off work for this and I'm already booked off work for November now. So I think that was the, the big win for this event. Yeah, there are a number of other events. So be sure to check out the Road to Extra Life details, both here checking in with the, uh, the podcast mm -hmm. and on the websites, both tabletopbellhop.com and windsorextralife.com as we move towards November. Now, getting to some actual games I played, um, we started off the event, Brian Percy was there and man, he was begging me to play Tower of Madness and I really wanted to show off Tower of Madness. Now, if you remember from our announcement section back at the top of the show, Kurt Covert had some tips for me to try the next time I played the game. So I made sure to use these when we play. And I got to say, well, I, of course, he knows what he's talking about. It's his game, but they did make a difference. Uh, I've now finally seen a game where a player's gone insane. I've even seen a game where two players have gone insane. I've seen people use the insanity cards, and I've actually seen it where players are converting spells into discoveries and turning the spells into points. And I've even had a game where the players won instead of Cthulhu destroying the world. 
This one got played a few times over the weekend, and it was fun to watch people sitting down around it and just sort of enjoying the the theme and the and the components of the game. Yeah, it definitely still the table presence on that game. I swear, everyone that walked in the store walked by that table and took a quick look at that game. Gameplay was better. It definitely was. Uh, the biggest tip I found based on Kurt's words were to tell players to draw tentacles from all over the place. Don't try to play safe. You don't want to remove the bottom layer and have nothing happen. Because uh, that's what's going to happen. The way you see the marbles is they're sitting on the top ones. Um, you want to make sure you start near the top in the middle. Uh, the one thing we did notice over the game is, man, if you want a, mar a lot of marbles to find the diagonal, horrors seem to hold up the most marbles pulling those almost always resulted in either uh marbles falling or at least a shift in the marbles uh though the one thing that i was surprised didn't help that i really thought it would because i tried this twice was taking the green marbles which are the cthulhu ones and putting them in last i really thought that would make it so the green didn't come out first and man they were some of the first to fall so that that was the one time i did that it right away those fell out it was a very short game Sometimes, madness is determined to settle in. Cthulhu will always succeed. <laughs> I gotta say, overall, Tower of Madness is more fun when players aren't playing it safe. Um, but there's still the one aspect I am not a fan of. Uh, Deanna is the one that pointed this out the first time, still feels this way, is that when you succeed in an investigation but don't have a high enough discovery total, like, that's just boring. Like, like you win, right? Because you succeeded but you get nothing like it. It's like the most boring state. It's almost as bad as like a miss a turn. Like, yeah, you got to roll the dice, but you get nothing for it. You don't get any points. You don't get to do the fun thing and pull tentacles. I, I really starting to think like I was thinking about if I designed this game, what I'd tweak. And what I would do is I would have the locations be worth two point totals and like say 10 points for the pr primary investigator and every other investigator who succeeded would get like four. Now that would require some more components and doesn't quite work with the game as it's published, but at least you get something, and it would turn the whole area control, it would turn the location cards into an area control game. Yeah, I think it seems to be a somewhat general agreement that while enjoyable to sit down with, the game has some minor balance issues that can frustrate some harder core gamers and lend this to, from being something that may be a little more flash in the pan or, or, or entry gamer and not uh, long-term. Uh, to be honest, like the game is is basically built on a gimmick, right? It's Kerplunk with Cthulhu, and I, it's going to appeal to certain people. There were people who loved it, like absolutely loved it. They were the Cthulhu fans, the people who like silly, take that style games, which, you know what? It's Smirk and Dagger. That's what Smirk and Dagger is all about. That is their brand, are the, the cutthroat, stab your opponent in the back type of games. And that's that is aspects to it. This isn't the kind of game for heavy gamers, and I gotta admit, I lead towards the heavy side. Now, the next game I played on Saturday was a four-player game of Dead Man's Cabal from Pandasaurus Games. Uh, this was a game with three experienced players, one brand new player. Uh, I, every time I talk about this game, I'm gonna be talking about the Oracle, because that is the big thing with this game. I did the best I could to explain how important the Oracle was. Uh, I pointed out players didn't want to use up their cubes when buying runes. I gave hints uh, about how to win the game. Despite all that, I got to say, like, uh, th this was a landslide victory for me. And I don't think I'm actually all that good. I just don't think I quite expressed well enough how well, how, uh, how scoring works. Like, I slaughtered everyone. Like, one of the players didn't break 100 points, and I had in the mid-200s. Yeah, I really have to say, though, this game displays so well and you didn't even use the dungeon interconnect to no. to really sort of bring it all together. Uh, it was still an eye catcher on the table. It was really hard not to walk by this game and go, <laughs> ooh, what's that? Yeah, we ended up moving the camera partway through just to stream it because we figured it was probably better for people to watch than just a whole game room. Now, for me, this was my best play yet. Like, I destroyed everyone, yes, but, like, that is also the, my highest personal score because, man, the, the scoring system is opaque. Like, it is, it's not clear. Like, it takes some games to learn. And I got to say, for me, it's finally starting to click, right? This is the first game where I actually had some synergy going with which skulls I was collecting, which skulls my guests required, and which skulls I was trying to score through the Oracle. Like, in the end, I had 24 skulls left over that scored the maximum amount through the Oracle. Like, that was 120 of my points there. 
Now, I think we've mentioned that when teaching games, it's a good idea not to baby your players, but it also isn't recommended to wipe the floor yeah. with them. I wasn't even trying. Like, like I was trying to win, but, like, I didn't even know until for final scoring I was doing that much better. I got to admit, like, I, I kind of felt bad. But, like, really what this reinforced to me is just how hard to grasp that Oracle scoring is. Like, some of the most opaque of two scoring I've seen in any game so far. Like, it really doesn't make sense until you played more than once like you almost have to play a game like I'm, I'm trying to think of how i can better explain it like i verbally have gotten it down to i think as clear as i can get it out like i'm thinking maybe the next time i play i'm gonna make it so the game ends sooner and make it so you only play until like take half the players cubes away just so they can see it i don't know because like that that the oracle thing's almost a mini game in itself and speaking of mini games i thought this was uh pretty appropriate one of the players Ryan, who was the first time he'd play it, felt that the entire game actually felt like playing three or four different mini games at once while still trying to keep track of an overall goal, which was the Oracle. And I got to say, that's, that's a pretty good description of how your brain has to work to play Dead Man's Cabal well. Overall, I do. I, I, it seems like I'm saying a lot of negative here, but I do dig the game. But man, that obscure, requires system mastery to do well level makes me worry that in this era of one-and-done board gaming where people play a game once and then move on to the next thing, I don't know if Dead Man's Cabal is going to be around much longer. I have a feeling it's going to get left in the dust just because it doesn't have that big wow factor the first time you play. Well, I think for some, the unique and amusing theme might keep it going for some time. But without that buy-in, I agree. It's in a crowded space right now. With its weight, it's a three out of five. And its playtime of 90 minutes to 120 minutes, that is a very, very crowded and competitive space right now for games. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of them out there. And, you know, if it's not, if, if you don't have that, uh, oh, I love the look of it, mm -hmm. you know, why go back to it? It just doesn't have that initial bang, right? Like, uh, it's, it's, it's really hard to sell any game on the market right now. It's like, you've got to play it three times to really enjoy it. Why would I play this three times when I can play three new games, right? Yeah, like that's that's, that's, that's kind six of the hours, mentality. Right. You know, it's you know, you've you six hours of your life to learn the game. Yeah. That's that's a tough uh Yeah. Now I gotta admit I like it. I think it's worth learning, but I like those style of games. Wait three is a nice good minimum for me to really enjoy a game. Uh speaking of heavy games and games with high weight, I was really pleased to see Neil Hilmar out at the event Saturday. Now, he's one of the locals that really digs heavy games. Like, he's he's the military war gamer, the guy that's into 6 to 12-hour Euros. Um, he likes his heavy games. And it was cool to see him out to a public event because he's one of those gamers who sticks to his regular game group that tends to get together Saturday nights. Neil brought a bunch of games, um, of which we decided to play Teo to walk in because he had the hot new expansion, the late pre-classic period. Now, I played my copy of Tales to Walk in a handful of times, uh, including teaching it at Queen City Conquest. I am a big fan of the base game, but I've been curious about this expansion because I saw it at Origins and I wasn't allowed to touch it, which was kind of frustrating. And I really wanted to see these new components. This is one of those games Mo can't keep himself away from. After all, it's got rondelles. Yes, it does. And it adds something else I love, which I'll get to in one minute. Uh, the late pre-classic period comes with a bunch of modules. Uh, it's... People call this a spiritual successor to Zolkin because it's the same designer, similar theme. Interestingly, the expansion for Zolkin is very similar to the expansion for this and adds very similar types of modules. It seems like something the game designer likes. The main thing, one of the biggest things that this expansion adds are tribes or gods. As far as, I, I haven't read the rules. Uh, Deanna thought you were picking a god. Personally, I thought you were picking a tribe that worshipped a god. But whatever it is, you get a tile, you're going to pick a tribe to play. And this gives you some form of player benefit as well as some penalty. Now, the one I played let me take two actions every time I ascended a worker. But every time I wanted to go up on a god track, I had to play extra cacao. Now, Neil had something where he could use other players' dice on the production spots, but he had to pay extra whenever building the temple. Now, what these tribes add is something everyone should know by now I love, and that is a symmetry. So this expansion is not all or nothing. You yep. can pick and choose what you want to add into your game, which I think, especially for this particular game, mm -hmm. is a really important detail. Very true. Yeah, all of these are separate modules. 
and I'm probably going to miss some of them. Because, again, I didn't read it. Neil set it up. Uh, as far as I know, he threw everything into the pot. Um, the second one, their second module or whatever we used, was two new worker placement spots. And what it replaced were the original spots for building the temple and painting the steps, which were a huge part of the base game. What these did was change it so the value of your dice that land on the space matter, which is a big difference because before all that mattered was your number of dice. And you now have to have higher dice in order to build the upper levels of the temple. Now, what I liked about this is it slowed the game down because every game I played at the base game ends because the temple gets built, not because the time runs out. So it was cool that this new board made it less likely to happen, that the game could be rushed to the end by a player who just focuses on the temple. Yeah, now I think slow down is a key term in what that expansion did. This is already a thinky game. Yeah. And the expansion, very clearly from my mm -hmm. external point of view, <laughs> did nothing to speed up what is already a longer game. Yeah, if anything else, you could probably check this on Board Game Geek while I'm talking, but I am going to guess that it upped the weight of the game, not reduced it. This was not a streamline, make the game faster. This was definitely more options, more choices, more control over your destiny, which I made it for a longer game. Yeah, as I, I seem to remember that the uh, there isn't enough details yet on yeah, okay. uh, late pre-classic to, uh, um, to really give it... Uh, Oh, actually, no, sorry. Yeah, it's a weight of four. On, yeah, uh, so that's higher. Yeah, that's so it's a 3.72 3. Yeah. for the uh, Teo Tawakin and a three point and a four for yeah. Late Breed Classic. Once you get up to four on Board Game Geek, your, your, your smoke's coming out your ears. <laughs> <laughs> and it was like that. So one of the other things that these new boards did uh, was a lot of the actions let you unlock locked dice. Now, this I thought was a great addition. Now, this is something that did speed it up a bit. Because in the original die, locking a die was powerful but painful. Because you have to pay three cacao, which cacao is your money in the game, and it's very tight, where you had to literally skip a turn to unlock your guys, which that kind of sucked. Now locking dice is actually more viable. So I dig that, and unlocking is less painful, and actually that does speed up the game you're not taking those missed turns. Now the last large addition that pre-classic period added was a new god track. So in the original game, there's three gods. This adds a new orange god. And then this one was funky because if you went up the track, you got like technologies or powers. You, you had ways you could break the rules. And I got to say, they seemed extremely powerful. Now, Neil really took advantage of this track. Like he had played multiple times and he just raced up this thing. Deanna and I, I got to admit, I don't, I don't know if she intentionally ignored it or it just happened. We both didn't even touch that track. It just for me, it was just there was too much other new stuff going on. And oh, yeah, new stuff. Seasonal events. That was something else that happened. Because every eclipse, you flip the tile, and again, the green rules were broken sometimes. So one of them, we flipped it over, and we could pay extra cacao to go up the god tracks quicker, which sucked for the god I was playing, because I already had to pay extra cacao to go up the tracks anyway, and I could never afford it. And actually, I think that's kind of what lost me the game, was not adapting to that seasonal change well, because it really screwed me over. Um, another season, we didn't have to pay cacao for our own dice, which is great, but we kept forgetting that we didn't have to pay for it. I... Uh, the events were okay. I, eh, they, they, they were kind of neat, I guess. The boards, though, I, I liked. They, they they definitely had more impact. And I got to say, there's there was other stuff. I'm sure there were. I'm sure there were new discovery tiles. There were probably new technology tiles. I, as I said, I've only played my base game a handful of times, so I wasn't going to recognize what was new and what was from the original. Overall, though, I got to say, I liked, liked what I saw. Um, Everyone listening knows how much I dig asymmetry, so adding that in, big thumbs up. That That is a rule. If I own that module, I would never not use. If I own the expansion, I would never not use that module. Um, I did really dig the replacement building and plant painting tiles. I do like it, the fact that high-level dice mattered more, and it made the game was no longer who can finish the temple first, so that was a nice change. As for the other stuff, it seems solid. Um, I know next game, I definitely pay more attention to that orange temple. Now, and that was just one table of what was going yeah. on at the Extra Life event. Elsewhere, we had Architects of the West Kingdom, mm -hmm. Wingspan, Terraforming Mars, Tower of Madness getting played pretty constantly. Yeah. Uh, off in one corner, we had what we had at one point thought were magic players. Yes. Because, but it turned out they were playing the brand new, unmatched Robin Hood versus Bigfoot with the Bruce Lee expansion. Uh, and we even had some Harry Potter Funko Pop getting played there. It was a 
busy and fantastic weekend for games. Yeah, and that's not even counting the card games. There were people playing Magic. There were yeah. people playing Yu-Gi-Oh! I saw at least. There was a group that were painting miniatures for War Machine. Uh, we also had some RPGs going on as well. Yeah, and uh, Angie Games got in a round of uh, Bang the Dice game. Yep. Uh, since Neil was cool enough to teach Deanna and I Teo to walk in, I felt I should pay him back. And I did so by teaching him Gentis with uh, the Deluxified Edition I've got. I know that's a game he's been really curious about. He did not back the Kickstarter. And I think I was just trying to get a little dig in there and try to make him feel even worse for not backing the Kickstarter. Because I knew this is the kind of game Neil digs, right? So besides the fact that he's into heavy games, right? The weight. And he's going to dig the mechanics. And he's going to dig the way it looks. He is also a classics major who does archaeology for a living. He actually goes to dig sites. And here's a game about pre-classic civilization. So I knew I, I right here, Neil's wheel, wheelhouse. I'm like, here's a game for Neil. Uh, we played a four-player game. Uh, it took us under two hours, including teaching the game. Besides Neil, the other players had played before, so that was good. Uh, Neil, being an experienced gamer, picked up the rules really well. Uh, man, this was a tight game. Like, this was a group of heavy gamers sitting down to play a heavy game, and we all gave it our best. Um, cheat jars were there for the event. If that had shown up on the table, I think someone would have slapped someone putting a cheat jar in front of us. It was not that kind of night, night game for us. Um, the final scores were literally within five points of each other, and the winner was up in the air until the final scoring. And it wasn't until the final scoring of Civilization cards in hand that swung the victory. Because one of the players had a six-point card that they couldn't finish, which means they lost three points. Whereas I had a 12-point card in my hand that I could finish, so it scored me six. It's a kind of ticket-to-ride kind of scoring system at the end. And literally, like it's like, oh, you've won. Oh, you have to take that penalty. Oh, you've won. Oh, wait, you have an hourglass. Oh, wait, I've got this card in my hand. Like, it was that close between all the players. That was a really enjoyable game. Had a great time. And, of course... Neil loved it as well, which I expected. And actually, he sent me a message today on Facebook saying he found a copy from someone in London, Ontario, and he's going to pick it up this weekend. <laughs> so that definitely did what it was supposed to do. Now, I got to say, though, playing Dead Man's Cabal, followed by Gent, or Teotihuacan, followed by Gentis, with a bunch of players who dig heavier games, was overall highlight for Saturday. Like, it's not often I get to sit down, not have to worry about taking too long, not having to worry about the event ending knowing that i have 12 hours and being able to play longer more brain bringing games with equally qualified players equally good players oh man that was nice so i gotta say when gentis ended i was quite burnt out <laughs> well you did do back to back to back heavy yeah. games so it'd be hard not to be a bit fried after that now while you were off enjoying deluxified editions uh, I finally got to get in a little bit of gaming as Dee brought over Go Cuckoo and introduced me to the <laughs> wonders of this ABBA game. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got a couple of games in, and I have to say, we were getting pretty exploratory with our stick placement <laughs> spreading far and wide from the uh, supporting can. I saw pictures of that game. That was the widest nest <laughs> I have ever seen. Now, for me, too, like you were playing Go Cuckoo after, after Gentis, I'm like, I'm done. I need, I need light games. Uh, that's when I took the time to set up a crazy pitch card track. Uh, I finally got to use some of my long straightaway expansion pieces because I'd never used those before. And I got to use the jump from the pitch card extension pack one. Um, I actually took two separate tables and had a gap between them with the long piece and the jump hooking it together. And I gotta say it looked awesome and it sounded great in theory, but as Sean can attest, it was a little harder to actually make that jump than I had attended. Uh, the three of us that played had fun, but I got to say, uh, we ended up getting our steps in, and I think I probably did a thousand squats picking up my pieces on the floor after failed jump and failed jump and failed jump. Yeah. Now, while I was familiar with Pitch Car, I think most people have uh, you know heard of it, especially if you listen mm -hmm. to this podcast. I've never actually played the game before. And I was surprised at just how many and varied techniques there are that are both possible and sometimes required to circumnavigate the different aspects of the track. Uh, unfortunately, though, as we've mentioned, the initial design was a bit over eager yeah. uh, and there were two separate aspects that stopped each one of us dead at one point or another during the game for significant periods of time. Uh, both, both the hill upwards and mm -hmm. the jump. Uh, proved to be significantly more difficult than I think anyone expected going in. Yeah. 
Yeah, I tried a couple test flicks when I made the jump, and I don't know, I was lucky at the time or something, and it didn't seem that hard. But we totally should have instigated, uh, you know, after five flicks, you just make it rule or something like that. Or really, I just should have started with a simple track, but I wanted to show it off. And I was actually really hoping to get the table of RPG players over to play, but they, they man, they were giving Sean a lot of feedback, which is good for Sean. He was running a play test, but I kept thinking, I'll set this up, and I'll get all those guys, and we'll play 10 players, because you can play pitch card 10 players. And that and was that Sean Hamilton, happen. not Sean Yes. Hamilton. <laughs> True. Uh, last game I played of the night uh, was Go Cuckoo. Uh, I'm burnt out. I'm tired. I was about to go home, but then Ryan, I think was his name. I apologize if I got that wrong. Someone who showed up to one of our easy mode events for the first time in the last week had shown up and he had heard about the game and he had asked to play it. So I sat down and played a two player game with Ryan and that was pretty cool. He came out support us just for extra life. And of course, Ryan loved it because everyone, seriously, I still, I can't. Uh, Go Cuckoo's been played multiple times for the event. I even played it. I've yet to find a single person who doesn't like this game. Like, I'm not trying to, like, brag or whatever, but, like, seriously, I can't find someone who doesn't like this. Like, for me, though, it was great. That was the perfect cap to the great day. I'm, like, done. I put, I put uh, Kiki Cuckoo on the top of the nest. I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Now, overall, while it was a long day, and yeah. on my end, from the streaming side of things, both fruitful and frustrating at various points for experimenting with the stream. It was a great day of gaming and yeah. a nice warm map, if not quite necessarily as financially beneficial for the charity as we had uh, hoped. Oh, we didn't do terrible. You know what? We made 200 bucks. We wouldn't have made if we weren't there. Yeah. Now, how about a look ahead? What do you have planned for the coming week? All right, so for a change, there aren't any public play events I'm hosting for literally the next three weeks. So I'm hoping to get through some of the games I got at Origins. I've been distracted by easy mode events and breaking out old gateway games. I need to get back to playing some of the games I brought home. So uh, this is going to mean people are going to expect a bunch of unboxing videos coming up, uh, including one here that uh, my friend Mike Murphy recently got a Kickstarter. I'm on the side. Oh, my God. Zombicide Invader, which is in this box, which weighs 55 pounds. Uh, that got dropped off on his doorstep last week. And he got a hold of me and he's like, hey, do you want to unbox it? And I'm like, you know what? I know that's hot. That's hot off Kickstarter. It's miniatures. It's cool mini. It's going to look cool. So I am hoping to get this unboxed in the next couple of days. All right. And there's also a chance we might get in some more streaming online play. Yes. So keep your Twitch notifications turned on and you might get to see some of the digital versions of board games getting streamed live on the channel right here. Yeah, our Twitch stream, this is a, this a, a pre-warm-up. We might even be trying it tomorrow. We may have stuff going on Thursday nights going forward. 